Okay, welcome to the Gazelle School of Business webinar on hiring your first technician. This is one of many free webinars we're offering to the piano service industry that will cover every topic you can imagine related to building and running a piano service business. Now, our team will be monitoring the chat and the Q&A, so ask your question there, and we will try to answer as many as we can at the end. Okay, let's dive right in. It is just tragic to try to attempt to grow your business by trading a massively profitable opportunity for a money-losing venture. Now, when it comes to expanding your team, you often start as a, as a successful and profitable freelancer. But when you begin pivoting your business from being a solo freelance service provider to a team-based approach with subcontractors and or employees, the path is full of potential missteps and pitfalls that need to be avoided. And you know, these things aren't going well. You know it's not going well. When you start feeling stressed, overwhelmed, overworked, time poor, thoughts like, am I a failure start to enter your head? Because deep down, you know that running a team-based business is theoretically possible, but you're struggling. And today, we're gonna help you avoid these pitfalls. If this is your first time joining one of our webinars, I'm George. And I'm here tonight with Timothy Barnes and the team at Gazelle, where we help you save time while your customers and grow your piano service business. Hey, George, I'm glad to be here tonight. Uh, you know, if I'm going to be honest, I started my business about 17 years ago as a solo freelancer, and I did not know much at the time, but I knew this. I did not want to be a freelancer my whole life. So after spending about seven years as a freelancer, successfully growing my personal book of business, I decided to build a piano service company that wasn't solely dependent on me. I also made just about every mistake in the book. And looking back, I wouldn't wish any of my past mistakes on my worst enemy. When I first started, I had the big picture, but I didn't know how to get there. I also didn't have a guide because the predominant advice I got from seasoned piano technicians was, do not ever hire someone. I tried that once and they stole all my clients. Well, I did hire people. They did not walk off with all my customers. And I worked hard to try to build a business that supported our people and that I was proud to work in. Yeah. And Tim, your struggles as a young business owner who was just trying to figure things out as you went, that isn't, it isn't uncommon. In fact, the more we talk to piano technicians who want to take this step, the more we see similar struggles. But it doesn't have to be this way. Because successfully hiring your first technician is possible if you, one, evaluate your infrastructure, two, set everyone up for success, and three, hire the right person at the right time. So let's make the dream less elusive and show you how to make this leap attainable. So let's start with step one evaluating your infrastructure. The business you are today isn't always the business you need to become. You might be a successful freelancer today who has a problem called, uh, I have too much work to handle. But just because you had a problem doesn't mean you need an employee, especially when there are other ways to be a successful freelancer. You have a problem and you need to find the model that fixes it. Now, Seth Godin has a great quote. Freelancers should never trick themselves into thinking they're entrepreneurs. The way a freelancer grows is not by hiring other freelancers who sort of look like you, but work a little cheaper, and a little harder. Someone who looks like you, but costs less and works harder, that kind of person doesn't exist. You see, every freelancer has a dilemma. The more successful a freelance piano technician becomes, they eventually hit a wall and then they think they can't grow their company without hiring another technician. And this might be true for you, where you're at in your business today, but often you start this journey thinking that you need to hire someone that looks a lot like you and works a lot like you, uh, only who's going to do it a little bit cheaper. And if this is how you approach it, at best, you will probably get there but along the way, you're going to make some mistakes, burn through some cash, and spend about five to 10 years figuring it all out. And at worst, you're going to hire the wrong person, train your competition, and then wonder why things went sideways. And if you talk to 
any piano technician who has been through a bad hiring experience, experience, they will probably say something like, and all of this could have been avoided if I had required them to sign a non-compete agreement. Well, we have some bad news for you. This isn't always true. And non-competes are rarely addressing the real problems. But this is such a common response in this trade that we have to start by asking, is hiring somebody a bad idea, right? Am I better off just raising rates and working alone as a freelancer? That's a valid question. And the answer is, it actually depends on a lot of things that we're going to cover later in this webinar. And it often hinges on a bunch of really simple things like, what kind of help are you hiring? A subcontractor or an employee? And can your business sustain this position? It is normal to find some success as a freelancer and eventually ask this question, should I hire someone? It's rare to immediately come to the correct conclusion. So we're going to give you a solid framework for making this decision and then guide you through the process of ultimately hiring your first technician. So if we woke up in your shoes, here are a few questions we would immediately ask. First, what kind of business owner are you? Is your goal to be a freelancer who gets to live and work like a freelancer? Or is your goal to be a business owner who focuses on building a team of technicians? You see, freelancing is a really great solution that has a ton of upsides, but so does hiring additional technicians and building a team-based approach. If you want to be the type of business owner who hires a team, even if you're just thinking about having a small team, you're by default choosing to use a different approach to grow your business. Now, you may not be that kind of business today, but you probably know deep inside if this is a goal you want to aim for. So listen to that inner voice because it'll guide you to a great solution that you'll be happy to live with. The next question that you need to ask is, are you at a stage change or is your business at a stage change? Most piano service companies will hit business stage change challenges when they approach and ultimately cross $100,000 in revenue, $300,000 in revenue, $1 million in revenue, and $3 million in revenue. If you cross one of these thresholds, it doesn't matter how successful you've been in the past. You have a problem because you technically can't grow past these points without changing or adjusting your people, your product, and your processes. In other words, what got you here isn't necessarily what will get you past this point. You have to adjust and adapt your people, your product, and your processes, otherwise you plateau. The point is most freelance piano technicians start thinking about hiring somebody as they approach that $100,000 in annual revenue mark. And that is that first business stage change challenge that you're organically gonna hit whether or not you hire somebody. And so clearing this stage change means a lot more than just hiring a new person in your business. If you are at a stage change, it takes more work to hire someone because you have to do more than just find somebody to make this hire a success. And that is why hiring your first technician is so difficult because it often coincides with a stage change and owners often rush into hiring someone only to have them ultimately leave because you didn't have the processes in place to support your new team member or because your products and services were not priced right and they couldn't make enough money to put food on the table or fill in the blank. The point is some people will leave because you, of you, not them. And often you see this play out when you hire someone without addressing all these stage change challenges at the same time. And so, we did an entire webinar on this called Tripling Your Revenue. So if you're interested in how to clear these stage change challenges, if that's where your business is at, watch that webinar uh, when you have some extra time because that's gonna walk you through the various points that you're gonna need to do. Next, uh, you wanna ask, what problem are you trying to solve? If you feel stressed during your busy season, you probably need a vacation, not an employee. But if you feel stress 12 months out of the year, well, no, that's a different problem. And if the problem you're trying to solve is that you want to retire and sell your business, 
well, then you need to watch our video on retiring and selling a piano service business because you, you probably don't need an employee to do this. And if you simply want to earn money, then you need to watch our video on pricing your services and focus your business on the right things, which can be done at different levels as a freelancer or a business owner. And if you want to grow your team because you have a bigger vision than just working as a freelancer, then you're about to make a radical change in your business. And this is going to sh uh, shock a lot of your current systems. So the point is, you need to think through and specifically name the problem you are trying to solve. And depending on the problem you're solving, adding a team member may or may not be the right solution. Next ask, what do I want? Do you want to build a big team or a small team? Right? Are you thinking of hiring just one person and that's really the end goal? Or are you thinking that this is the first of many different hires that you're going to try to do? Now, if you're a solo freelancer today, you certainly don't need to build the infrastructure needed to manage and train a large team. Instead, focus on using subcontractors. But if you are thinking about hiring an employee to be your first, third, sixth, or 15th technician, ultimately, then your revenues are going to be high enough that your business is probably also going to be going through a stage change challenge at that first, third, sixth, and 15th hire. So building a team of people is how business owners solve a problem they've identified in their business. And at the end of the day, they typically use both employees and subcontractors as needed. So finally, you're ready to ask, should I continue as a freelancer or grow my business into a team? And this is where it's really helpful to just draw a line in the sand. Freelancers work by themselves and possibly subcontract. And that's it. There's room for both freelancers and business owners to hire other technicians, but their motivations couldn't be more different. A freelancer's ultimate motivation is to charge a healthy rate that keeps their schedule full, but not too full. Really successful freelancers often charge more than a business with employees could ever get away with. And if their schedule gets too full, a freelancer can solve that problem by either raising rates or possibly subcontracting someone until their workload is more manageable. Business owners, however, who are building a team, price their services to cover costs, optimize growth, and generate consistent profit. And to do this, they mostly hire employees, and sometimes subcontractors, to meet the demand for their business at a set price. So which is better? The freelancing approach? or the business owner team-based approach? Honestly, neither. You see, the process of hiring an employee or the process of digging your heels in as a freelancer will help you exceed the limitations you feel today and expand what your business is capable of. And it's also going to transform who you are and how you choose to think about running your business. So the approach that's best is for you to have clarity on which problem you're dealing with as a freelancer. I have more work than I can handle, I want to make more money, I want more time, or the problem called, I want to change into a business owner who builds a team. The one you should do ultimately doesn't matter as long as you know what you're signing up for and have a workable plan for how to get there. Because if you're a freelancer and the problem you're trying to solve is called, I have more work than I can handle, well, there are many ways to handle this. You permanently raise rates as a freelancer, permanently shrink your service area, permanently turn down certain types of work, all of this will solve the problem. And if you do all of this and you still have more work than you can handle, then keep raising rates, shrinking your service area, and turning down jobs you don't want until you have enough work to fill your schedule, but not enough to make you drown. And while you're doing this, you'll discover that you're driving less, you're probably happier, and you're earning a whole lot more than you used to. And you can do all of this as a solo freelancer who works a schedule that is as full as you want it to be. But there is a limit to how much you can earn doing it this way. So you need to ask, do you want fewer clients who pay better? Is that enough for you? And if not, then the problem you are trying to solve might be called, I want to increase my earning potential. Now, keep in mind, the way a freelancer grows is by raising rates and going after fewer, better, higher paying clients. That increases their earning potential and subcontracting is needed. 
For a freelancer, subcontracting is the exception, though not the rule. But when a freelancer knows how to do this the right way, they can and oftentimes do earn as much or more than they could by hiring a small team of technicians. And Tim, this problem of increasing your earning potential is closely tied to another problem that sounds a lot like, I want more time in this area of my life. Because earning more in the same amount of time and earning the same amount but working less is essentially two sides of the same coin, right? And if this is the problem you're trying to solve, then you have a capacity problem. And you need to find the model that fixes that. And this could look like you use Gazelle to be your first office assistant by automating and streamlining all the various parts of your business so that you can retire from a lot of your office work, send out reminders, fill your schedule, and reduce the time you spend on the phone. And if you find you're still answering too many phone calls, then you can even hire a real office assistant to help you by answering client inquiries and phone calls. And you can hire an accountant to free up your end of the month. So you have to spend time reconciling all your books. And you can even hire temporary help from other piano technicians or service providers and still be a successful freelancer. This could be a piano mover or a young technician you subcontract with to, to serve as spinets during your busy season. So you can be available to, for the uh, higher value customers or even hire a few different subcontractors, each with their own area of expertise. This could be someone on the edge of your service area or someone who has a shop and only does certain types of repairs or a piano mover or a young technician a moment a moment ago. The point is you can do all of this while using Gazelle and still be a freelancer at heart who has a team of people you subcontract on as a, a you subcontract on an as needed basis. Oftentimes, you'll be happier, you'll make more money this way than a struggling business owner with a team of employees, all because you have the clarity on the best way to grow your business and the best way to achieve your goals. But this isn't the right approach for everyone. See, because if the problem you have is called, I have a vision and I need a team of people to help grow this company, that's when it's time to change your business model and to get ready to hire your first employee. So this is where a very distinctive shift needs to happen to transition from being a freelancer to a business owner who is using a team-based approach. And much of this work needs to happen before you hire your first technician. And if you are confused about how to do this, you should be. Because up until now, you have never needed to be anything but a freelancer. But now that you are considering hiring another technician, as an employee, you need to know how to navigate the problems you are going to have as a bigger business. And just because you have a website and a clever business name doesn't mean you're ready to successfully hire and manage a team. Because sometimes all it means is you're a freelancer with a website and a clever business name. If you make this transition, your job changes and you become the owner of a different kind of business the moment you hire and take responsibility for somebody else. So, all right, put simply, freelancers don't hire or only hire temporary subcontractors who work within the systems currently developed by the freelancer to get the workload done. Business owners manage a different set of systems developed specifically to lead a team to carry out the vision and deliver on the brand of their company by hiring a team of employees and the occasional subcontractor. Now, you need this clarity about your identity because it influences all of your infrastructure decisions. Your business's infrastructure is the first place these shifts happen. This is simply defined as all the resources you need to produce a certain amount of goods and services. And in your business, these are generally spread into three categories that need to stay on track with each other. Dave Ramsey talks about these as three legs of a stool, revenue, cash flow, and then there's accounting and human resources. The important thing to remember is you can't have one leg of the stool growing faster than the others or you are going to have a problem. And as you grow, you need different people, products, and processes to support each of these areas of your business. So let's talk about revenue. For instance, if you are going to grow revenue, 
you need more technicians or you need more people to actually do the work. You need more customers, which affects the client acquisition processes that you currently have in place. And you're probably going to expand the services you offer as your team grows. And consider this, if you double revenue, you probably need to increase your cash flow projections so you can cover your growing monthly expenses. Because in order to double revenue, you had to take on some additional costs. You never want to get caught owing $5,000 today while waiting on a check to clear the bank. You need that to be the other way around. And if you cannot run a profitable company that has good cash flow, then you have no business hiring employees. It is not fair to you or your employees to invite them to work for a failing company. That is a nightmare, not a good opportunity. And you need to make sure you have excess profit above your historical targets because hiring employees almost always cost more than you expect. But if this isn't something you know how to do, then you simply need to get some new tools in your tool belt. Because when talk, taking on another technician, the stakes are higher and it's time to buckle up and become a business owner who keeps their books in order. You need to know how to use a PL statement and a balance sheet and a statement of cash flows. And you need to know how all the information in each of these documents applies to each of your decisions. And this is where a good accountant is needed because they can teach you how to do this. You're right, Tim, which is why hiring an accountant or an HR expert to help with payroll needs to be part of your plan. You see, anytime you increase revenues, Anytime, you tend to also need to increase your accounting and HR support. Somebody on your team is producing more work, more revenue, and more invoices, which means someone else on your team needs to spend more hours to keep things flowing for your employees, process their payroll on time, cover payroll taxes. Now, we are not going to say don't hire an employee without an accountant or an HR person to help you out, but don't hire an employee without an accountant or HR person to help you out. George, if I could help anyone to learn from my stupid mistakes, this would be one of them. I waited way too long to take this step, and it only took me about five minutes with an accountant to realize how stupid I was to DIY this part of my business. One really good example of this is about a decade ago, I needed to track something, and I didn't know what I didn't know. So I ended up customizing QuickBooks to track it in the most time-consuming way possible. When I finally hired my accountant, they took one look at this and then looked at me sideways and asked, what exactly are you trying to achieve by doing it this way? Then in less than five minutes, they enabled a few hidden features in QuickBooks and simplified my entire process. I couldn't believe it. I had literally wasted countless hours over the past 10 years, all because I didn't know how to do five minutes of work. A good accountant is worth every penny you will pay them. All right, so the next infrastructure elements that you need to evaluate is your customer relationship manager. And honestly, if you're using Gazelle, you're good. Logistics of handling multiple technicians' calendars used to be a huge headache, full of time-consuming work. And now it's as easy as creating a new technician user under your Gazelle account, uh, setting up their scheduling rules, and benefiting from your choice to use a program that scales with your needs. which brings us the topic of office staff. Again, you don't have to have a receptionist answering the phones before hiring your first technician, especially if you're utilizing the scheduling automation Gazelle provides. But someone is going to have to eventually field twice as many requests, phone calls, and emails because you're trying to fill twice as many appointment slots. Gazelle makes managing all this more efficient but the person interfacing with all of these customers is either going to be you, your office assistant, or the technician you hire. And for some great tips on how to do this, you can watch our video we did on hiring your office assistant, hiring your first office assistant, and create a plan to fill this position when you're ready. Another part of your business infrastructure that needs attention is your marketing, and in particular, your new client acquisition because new clients get more expensive with time. Simply put, you are growing your business. Where are all these clients going to come from? As a general rule, your first client is the easiest and cheapest client you will ever pay for. 
but every additional client you get is going to cost you more and more money and time. Word of mouth works great for a freelancer, but it doesn't always fill multiple technicians' calendars, especially if all the word of mouth has your name attached to it. So watch our video on finding and retaining new customers if you want to some guidance on how to navigate this area of your business, because you are going to spend time and money attracting new customers into your business. Your ability to retain them is only as strong as your people that you are sending out and their ability to provide a consistent and personal customer experience. And one more thing to note here, marketing is different than branding. So your branding and storytelling capabilities are going to be tested the moment you start selling your team, not just yourself, right? Is your business ready for this challenge? Because specifically, how does this new person fit into the story arc of the brand you've built? Now, this is perhaps the biggest infrastructure deficit most freelancers face when hiring. You see, you got this far telling a certain story about your business, but now you need to adapt your story and write a new chapter. So you can watch our video on selling your story if you need to improve that part of your business. And here's the, the gist of it. If your story is currently all about you, your credentials, your five-star reviews, your education, et cetera, then you need a better story. Otherwise, you're going to have this employee sitting over here with a wide open schedule and a bunch of clients saying, yeah, yeah, I know we could have them out next week, but we'd rather wait five months to get onto your schedule. And next, you need to ask the question, do you have time for training and coaching? And we're going to put aside technical training, okay? You need to be prepared to coach and mentor this person into representing your brand and generating high enough revenues to justify their position. They are carrying your brand and they need to know how to tell your company's story and how they fit into it. And depending on who you hire, you may need to give some training on sales and you may want to avoid hiring a person who couldn't give away a stake to a starving person unless you are willing to train them. And as far as technical training goes, you have to have a solution for this. It doesn't necessarily have to be you, but if you need to become an educational program in order for somebody to successfully work in your company, then you're hiring the wrong person unless your company already has some kind of infrastructure in place called an apprenticeship program or a uh, on the job training kind of program in place, right? And, or some way to provide that training uh, in a structured way, right? You can't just ad lib this, which is going to come at an increased cost to you or somebody in your business, probably you, right? So regardless of how much training somebody has the day you hire them, if you don't invest time in your people through training and coaching, they will continue to have the deficits they had when you hired them. And not just that, they will get worse because you have now signaled that you don't care about improvement in those areas. This can lead to technical deficits on top of sales deficits, on top of brand deficits, which will further decrease both the value to, their value to you, your value to them, as well as the company's value to your customers. And the main thing you need to take away here is this. Good business infrastructure prevents disaster, right? Finances, office staff, marketing, branding, training. You need to have a plan for improving your business infrastructure in place before, before you hire an employee. Choosing to not address any of these infrastructure problems can turn your first hire into a nightmare. But it doesn't have to be that way. If you have a plan for addressing these things, and remember, don't jump the gun. For a short time, you need to continue behaving like the business you are today until you are ready to implement your new systems. If you are a freelancer, keep making decisions as a freelancer until you're ready to be successful in making the change. Because you're not just hiring a new team member, you're transitioning to being a business owner with a team. Doing all of this foundational prep work will give you more time to really focus your efforts on step two. So let's set everybody up for success, including yourself. Now, we are dropping a link into the or to a guide in the chat 
um, for you to download that has a ton of resources you can reference later. And to make this entire hiring process a success, you want to make sure that the systems you have in place are set up so that you can handle the added expenses, revenues, duties, and responsibilities. And to do that, both you and your future employee need certain things to happen. So before you hire, you need to set up a few things. First, you're going to set yourself up financially. You see, you deserve to be paid for the work you do in your business. And you also deserve to have the cost of having an employee covered. So a lot of people think about the potential revenue of hiring somebody and not the expenses required to get that revenue. So consider all the expenses involved in hiring, like paying an accountant and bookkeeper to do the books, and manage payroll, paying a part-time office assistant, or paying for increased hours from your current office staff paying yourself something additional for the time spent training or coaching or mentoring, spending an extra $10,000 on marketing to fill their schedule, spending an extra $300 in liability insurance because your premiums go up when you hire an employee, covering the cost of your new payroll taxes and any other benefits you want to offer people. And finally, paying them for their work. Now, okay, don't let that list overwhelm you. You've got this. You've got this. We just want to make sure that after the dust settles, you've paid yourself well, and you still have profit sitting on the table. And speaking of paying them for their work, you need to set your team members up financially. If you don't, you will have a backdoor problem in your business, and they are not going to want to work for you very long. So let's give you a good framework for deciding how much to pay someone. So first, Pay them enough. You don't want to pay someone so little they leave within a year. And give them upward income mobility as well. There needs to be a clear way that they earn more by producing more revenue and a way for them to be earning more per appointment in the next three, four, and five years. If you get this wrong, it will cause turnover to be too high and that kills your profit. Yeah, and pay them what they're worth. A worker is worth his wages. This is a trade role that requires a lot of effort to learn. Replacement's going to be hard. So look at the pay scale in your area for various skilled trades and make sure that you're paying what the going right is or better. Aim to pay them well, but don't use pay as a reason for them to stay. This is a trap. People don't stay at a bad job for the money. They stay because they like the work and the work environment. Pay is almost always secondary. So consider this, if I offered you a $15,000 raise over what you are currently making today to take a job in a toxic work environment with a boss in this trade who will make your life a living hell, are you taking that job? So if you offer someone a non-toxic work environment with upward income ability and work they like doing, this is how you attract quality people. All right, now, pay them so that you can continue to pay them. So don't pay your employees so much that you can't make a profit or so much that you have to take a pay cut. Listen, their job is worthless if you have to fold the company because you ran out of money personally or professionally. It's not fair to you or them. And pay them for their expenses don't push company expenses onto your employees. What is acceptable for a subcontractor doesn't fly with an employee. So consider providing their tools and know that in some areas, if you require them to wear your logo, you have to provide their apparel. That's actually a law, a labor law in some areas. And reimburse them for the use of their personal vehicle if you don't provide a service vehicle. It is usually cheaper to do it this way until you're making enough money to manage, say, a fleet of wrapped cars. All right, so pay them for some time off. People burn out. Employees can't just work and work until they drop. And research shows that staff who are given time off are more engaged, they're more likely to stay, and they're overall better employees. Now, don't do this during your busy season or at the cost of your own sanity, but consider how some paid time off fits into your compensation package. And lastly, Pay them for benefits. Give them benefits as soon as you are able. 
right? Benefits usually cost 15 to 20% above their base salary. So $65,000 a year uh, salary to an employee is going to cost your company $78,000 a year with benefits. So this is about taking care of your people. You already gave them some pay time off. You already gave them reimbursement for their car which some would say is an expected benefit, not actually an over and above thing, but also consider giving them some sick days, providing for their health insurance premiums, disability and life insurance, or contributing to a 401k match, right? These are all benefit packages that are really easy to handle with payroll providers these days, right? We're not saying your company has to do all of this, but these kinds of things will not cause a good employee to stay in a bad company, right? So these are all optional above when you want to take care of somebody. But when you want to keep a great employee, these kinds of things become really important. And lastly, pay them. Oh, I'm sorry, George, my slide deck got out of order there. Um, all right, which leads us to another topic. You need to consider uh, compensation structure. So not only you know pay them well, pay them and cover those benefits, but how you structure paying your staff is between you, your staff, and your accountant, right? You want to make sure that you are paying a fair wage uh, so you don't lose talented people, but there are also quite a few ways to do it. So first, keep it simple. My first compensation structure for an employee looked good on paper, but in the real world, it was so complicated, neither my technician nor myself could figure it out each time it came time for payday, right? We made it work because I didn't know any better at the time, but over time we clarified and simplified everything because it was just too complex. Yeah, and keep it focused. You make X so much for one tuning. With mastery, you increase the pay and you get X bonus every time you service more than X dollars a month. The simpler it is, the more predictable it will be for everybody involved. And lastly, keep it steady. You make X dollars as a base salary or X percent of all revenue that comes from you. As a business owner, you want your team members to be able to easily predict and budget for their needs. If you overcomplicate things, you make it hard on you and your staff because every time they get paid, they'll be coming to you with questions about why it was this amount and not that amount. And if this is happening, your compensation structure is too complicated. Now, you can pay hourly as well, uh, but be careful about the labor laws in your area because you might also need to compensate them for time spent sitting in traffic. So don't run your calculations when you're looking at how much you can pay for this position only on the time it takes to do a service call. And so usually shop jobs and low skilled jobs are better paid hourly because it's more defined. But for skilled trades, you need to make sure that you are compensating everybody well. And we provide a lot more about this topic in your downloadable guide. So in addition to pay, you have to give them a thorough job description. You see, paying your staff is what they expect from you, but what do you expect from them in return? And how do you make sure you get what you paid for? So the job description solves that. This is an agreement between you and your employee. It's about communication and expectations. See, if they're expected to do something, put that in there. If you ask them to do something that's not in there, then you owe them. Sometimes acknowledgement is all that's needed, a kind word, a thank you, but you owe them. You're in their debt. And if you plan to ask them constantly to work outside their job description, then you know put $3,000 a year in your budget to buy them some really nice tools as a thank you. See, the key here is that being clear is being kind. So list everything. So some examples of what you might list. You're expected to show up on time for every appointment. Call if you're one minute late. Take 10 minutes at each appointment to diagnose the piano. Maybe take 10 minutes to try to sell a cleaning or other repairs. Take as much time as you need to do a good tuning. You should charge extra if you need a pitch raise. You're not doing free work. Do your best job servicing the piano. You could add things like, um, you're responsible to go out if we get any callbacks, or you need to pay me money to clean up after you. You need to be an RPT by this date. 
You need to have XYZ certifications. You need to attend X so many ongoing education things a year. And I'll pay for $1,000 for you to attend those trainings. This is a great place to add things like uh, you need to follow this dress code. You need to take your shoes off at the door. You need to carry a moving blanket to put case parts on. You're expected to purchase your own tools. Or you need to order any parts or supplies, but I will reimburse you. And George, this was an area I wish I had spent more time on earlier in my business because you know what happened? I spent twice as much energy as the employer because every time I asked somebody to do something that wasn't explicitly in the nefarious, uh, ambiguous job description I had given them, I felt this tension in the relationship. And it was my fault because I wasn't clear enough on my first few hires. So being clear is being kind carve out a day, write as thorough a job description as you can. And if this is your first hire, you're not going to be thorough enough. It's okay. Just tell your employee, hey, this list isn't exhaustive, but these are the core elements of your job uh, that I need you to be able to do. And that way you have some room to add things to the list and just tell them like on this day, we're going to reevaluate these things. Or on, you know, once a year, we're going to come back to this and I'll refine it. And, you know, if I'm asking you to do things that aren't in here, you know, we'll figure out how to make that work. Uh, but we just want this open channel communication. But here's what's in here today. So just remember, the first time you add something to this list, it is going to cost you some form of acknowledgement or compensation to your employee. Uh, because that was your oversight. So you did a job description, you asked them to do something that wasn't in there. The first time that happens, you need to compensate them. You are in their debt. You need to say thank you. You need to buy them a nice tool. Say, I, I, don't, I don't know what it is. You need to do something. But then add it to their list. So the next time this comes up, everybody knows that this is what's expected. Yeah. And that idea of really understanding what's expected comes down to simplifying their success metrics. You have to do this. A job description is different than the metric you use to measure their success. These are two different things we're talking about. This is the same between you and your employee as it is between you and your clients. You see, your client's not going to fire you if someone from your company drives up in a Ford or a Hyundai. But they will if the piano sounds horrible. So how your team gets the appointment doesn't matter as much as how well you do the most important parts of the job. And the same is true for your relationship with your employee. So reduce their success metrics down to three bullet points and tell your employee that these are the non-negotiables. These three things need to be so important to you that you're willing to terminate their employment over it, and they know it. And you'll follow through if you have to. Now, okay, this could sound something like um, you need to show up on time or call the client if you're late. After 12 months, you need to be selling at least $1,000 worth uh, a month in additional repairs. And you need to get 100 five-star reviews a year. And you're going to keep it simple, and you're going to communicate this with them when you hire them so they're not surprised. And one more thing here, George, don't expect them to be you. There is a 100% chance that you are hiring someone who has different skill sets than you. They should be competent, and they should care about doing a high-level work. They should be like you in this regard. So don't hire someone if they don't meet this criteria. But you have to consider that you are an expert. You have a following and you have years of experience behind you. They probably will not. So the expectation you set up between your customers and your employee matters a lot more than it did before. Instead of promising to clone yourself, Promise your customers that you are sending out someone who cares about their piano as much as they do and who is as dedicated to doing their best work just as you are and that you will back them up. And this is a subtle change that makes all the difference in the world. Only one person can fulfill the brand promise of being you. But anyone who cares about their work can fulfill the second set of promises of caring for their piano at a really high level. Now, your employee is a part of your team tasked with achieving the company's goals. So you need to set those goals and share them with your employee and then communicate what role you expect them to play in meeting these goals. So this can be as simple as we expect that in the first three months, you will average X so much in revenue. And we expect X months from now, 
you'll be producing X number of dollars in revenue. And we'll reevaluate our revenue goals at this point once you're averaging more than X dollars in revenue. Which brings us to the last part of setting yourself up for success, planning for turnover. Everybody is going to leave your company when they die, find a better job, or get fired. Now, thankfully, few people die on the job. So that leaves the other two options as the most common use case, right? People leave or they get fired. It happens. Don't be surprised to buy it. People leave for more reasons than you might think. But the three you are most likely to hear are they find a better job in a different career path. They find better pay or benefits at another company doing similar work, or they decide to leave and start freelancing on their own. You can't eliminate turnover. So the goal is to minimize turnover. If you spend $5,000 of your time training an employee, then it is going to cost you $5,000 every time you have to replace someone on your team. So it's worth your time to attempt to minimize turnover by addressing the underlying roots that cause an employee to start looking in the first place. So here's a few of the top reasons people leave. Bad management. The number one reason people leave a job is because of their manager, or in this case, you. So you need to be aware of how you treat your employees. Are they trusted? Are you transparent with them? Do you have their back? Are you giving feedback and showing appreciation? Or are you just a hard person to work for? Next is the work environment. Now, we are talking about field technicians here. So your employee won't be in the office, but they are being treated well by you and your support staff throughout the day. Right? Is that actually happening? Are you only sending them to the clients you would prefer not to have to interact with? Right? When they aren't in a client's home, what does your company value and what do you expect them to be doing? What is the culture like? Is there a constant sense of stress or fear? Right? Nobody wants to hate their job. So make working in your company fun and rewarding on more than a monetary level. Poor relationships. So poor relationships with other employees can cause good staff to leave. So if you have an office staffer that is less than ideal, but you've learned to live with it, don't be surprised if somebody else can't. So the employee problem that you don't solve becomes your problem to own. And you'll have this problem forever, or at least until you say enough is enough and require them to change or force them to leave. The challenge of the job, nobody wants to stagnate, right? If you only ever give them spinets, they will eventually quit. So find ways to develop and challenge them as a technician, nurture them into regulating and voicing and helping them develop and do more complicated work. And be, just as a decent human being, care about them. Your staff can't always support your quest to work on the nicest possible pianos while they get all the leftovers. So pay and benefits. And unfortunately, this is almost always the first thing that both staff and the owner try to tweak when one of the other factors are more likely the root cause of turnover, right? We immediately go to pay and benefits, but this often isn't entirely the problem and you can't pay them more money than you make. That isn't fair to either of you. And to completely eliminate your profits because it, it means the company's going to fail which means at some point you may be in the position of being unable to pay your staff what they want to be paid. And the likelihood is that if you're in this position, you hired a freelancer. So let freelancers go, set them free. The truth is if you accidentally hired a freelancer and you are expecting them to be a great employee, you need to let them go or choose to subcontract them instead. They're freelancers, they freelance. This is what they do. It's kind of in their blood, right? There are a ton of really awesome people out there who want to work for a bigger company and really don't want to freelance for a variety of different reasons. But you will never find them if you're afraid you might have to interview a few confused freelancers looking for a job as an employee. You just have to tell them, I'm not looking for a freelancer. 
I'm looking for someone who wants to work alongside me to achieve these goals. The, they might be a great technician, but that doesn't mean you need to hire a freelancer. And if you already hired them, you probably need to let them go. Which brings us to firing employees. Never hire someone you're unwilling to fire because one day things could change and you might need to fire them. This is never easy and it isn't always a clear cut reason why this needs to happen. Um, it could be relational deterioration, right? This is a great reason to fire someone. You no longer trust them to represent your company because of something they did. And this probably isn't their first misstep, but you're done here. And you need to let this person go immediately. And it could be that they're not meeting one of their success metrics. And that's why it's helpful to have it outlined beforehand when you hired them. And you said, these are so important, I'm willing to terminate your employment if you can't do this, whatever that may be. And lastly, there's the process known as managing them out. This is probably the most common form of firing. So they don't meet one of their success metrics and you help them be accountable and you work with them to address that area of their job performance. But instead of rising to the occasion, they actually turn in their resignation and leave. Essentially, it looks like this. Hey, you're not performing well in this area of your job and I want to help you do better. So here are some tools and I expect you to do this better. How can I help? And then they respond by quitting because the truth is they probably weren't performing in the first place because their heart wasn't in it. Now, the biggest fear piano technicians face in this situation is that this person is going to leave and go create their own company with your customers. So, okay, let's talk about non-compete agreements, their limitations, and their value to your business. Okay, disclaimer, we are not lawyers, obviously. And we cannot speak to the various limitations on these types of agreements in your state or your region. But suffice to say, these are general guidelines to keep in mind while you seek counsel from someone familiar with the laws governing these types of agreements in your area. Non-compete agreements can't have too long of an enforcement period, meaning you can't have an indefinite non-compete. In the US, anything over 18 months tends to get the attention of a good lawyer or judge and can be thrown out in its entirety for being too excessive. So if you have too long of an enforcement period after they leave your company, you lose when the judge rules it unenforceable. And they can't be too broad, meaning you can't ask someone to never work in the trader industry again. And for a service-based business where geography is really important, this means there needs to be a defined service area that limits this non-compete. They need the opportunity to move outside of a defined service area to pursue other employment in the same trade. And they can't be too prohibitive. They are designed to protect trade secrets. They are also designed to protect artisans who stake their livelihood on relationships, which is the definition of a piano service company. So they definitely apply to this trade and should be given adequate consideration when you are hiring people. Also keep in mind that if you are subcontracting other service providers, this isn't something you would ever ask a subcontractor to sign because it calls into question the very nature of subcontracting and the relationship between you and your subcontractor. If you exert control over somebody in this way, you cannot legally claim them as a subcontractor. They have to be paid as an employee. They can't be retroactive. You have to talk to them about it in the interview process. You can't offer the job and then retroactively ask them to sign the non-compete. It has to be part of the original employment negotiations to be enforceable. And you can't offer them the job and then threaten to take the job offer away because they'll not sign a non-compete. So if you violate any of these things, then there's a high likelihood that you cannot enforce your non-compete. Let's say you do everything right and still end up in a situation where you need to enforce something. Well, you better be ready to cough up some cash to have a lawyer pursue it. Now, in general, giving someone a good job with good benefits and a great work environment that also has upward mobility, this is the best way to keep an employee and can be cheaper than enforcing a non-compete. So a, a good non-compete should never be something you rely on as your primary defense. The best non-compete you can do, the best non-compete you can have is to hire good people you want to represent your brand and then make sure to set up their user account so they don't have access to all your data. Now, Gazelle does have an easy solution to this. 
Just don't make them a full administrator on your Gazelle account unless you want them to be able to download all your customer records. So is a non-compete agreement important? Yes, but only if you do things right so it is enforceable. And you never want to rely on this to create a successful working relationship and a successful working environment for your employee and inside your company. Right. This is just insurance for a really, really bad day. And when they are really good, uh, what they are really good at doing uh, is slowing the hiring process down just enough to cause really good people to ask really good questions. Like, do I really want to work for you in this company if I have to sign this non-compete? And what am I going to do if I decide I don't like working for you? Those questions need to be asked by an employee before they agree to sign that non-compete. And they need to be asked on both sides of the table. So a well-written and enforceable non-compete can keep bad actors from wasting their time in your business. The best non-compete agreement, though, is to avoid hiring the wrong person in the first place. Which brings us to step three, hire the right person at the right time. See, filling the right position with the wrong person is just as bad as never filling the position at all. In fact, it may be worse. If you need to plug short-term holes in your schedule, then consider subcontracting and taking some of the other approaches we already talked about. The right person might be a 1099. It might be an employee, depending on your business model, depending on where you're going, and depending on what your needs are. There is a good chance that if you have a great business model and the right supports for your team already in place, then they will become, the, an employee, not a 1099, will actually become a better technician than a freelancer ever could because they're not wearing too many hats and becoming a jack of all trades and a master of none. But ultimately for somebody to be a good employee and a great technician, they have to be a good fit for your company. They should be comfortable with the identity and opportunity they have to work in your company. Otherwise, they're probably a freelancer and not somebody you need to extend a job offer to. You might subcontract them occasionally, but that's it. So how do you find these people? Okay, you don't have to go on a unicorn hunt, but you do need to look in the right places. You're most likely going to attract employees through the following areas. First, your website. So if you're at the point where you want to hire, just put a we're hiring link on the footer of your website. And when I did this, uh, about once every eight weeks in the company that I ran for 17 years, I would get a really good lead from somebody somewhere considering working with our company. One time it was a new customer looking for a career change, right? I'd never met them, but I went out, serviced their piano, had a good conversation with them. Another was somebody moving totally across country to an area we serviced. Another was a piano teacher and a full-time mom who knew she wanted to pivot as she raised her kids. She didn't want to pivot back into full-time piano teaching. She had some experience in this trade and she wanted to pivot into it, right? And quite often it was a younger person interested in learning the trade. I didn't hire all of these people and I wasn't a good fit for everyone, nor did I always have the resources they needed, but I would always give them five to 10 minutes of my time. And if I was really interested in them, I would go meet them in person. And a few of them ended up being really good people I added to our team. Now, your customers are another source of potential leads. One of my most accomplished apprentices came to me because they were the adult son of one of my customers. And talk to local piano teachers with students. Sometimes just putting the word out is all you need to do to have one of them tell someone that they know about the opportunity to work with you in this trade. Transplants to your area are another great source, right? People move all the time and for a lot of different reasons. I had someone contact me once who was fully trained and a great technician. They were interested because their spouse was in medical school and they were just tagging along through their residency. They were only going to be in my area for a few years, uh, which wasn't enough time to spin up a business of their own. So they were looking for job opportunities. Semi-retired folks who want to work five more years or so um, are also a great source of people. 
it could be that they sold their business and they have grandkids in your area, or they've always dreamed of living in your city. Honestly, working with your company might be a part of their retirement plan. And lastly, there are the schools and trade groups like the PTG. Just going to events and meeting people can be a good way to find some. But you have to also consider that most of these people are going to be freelancers. But once you know how to spot the difference between a freelancer and somebody who will make a great employee for X, Y, or Z reason, you can easily focus your efforts on the right people and socialize with everybody else as just a colleague. All right. So how do you know that they're the one? They aren't. There's no perfect fit. And the one you think is perfect, the one that looks like you, works as hard as you do for just a little less money, well, congratulations. You just met your future competition. Seriously, finding the right person for your current needs is going to take getting to know the potential employee, which means you're going to have to do some interviewing. This isn't always easy work, and it usually goes slower when you hire your first technician. It becomes easier over time. Remember, this is a skill set you probably don't have if you've been a freelancer your entire career. If you're on this path, then you're building a team in an industry where doing a team-based approach isn't that common. Not because it can't be done, but mostly because tools like Gazelle and the resources available to small businesses these days are new in the grand scheme of things. Which brings us to another question. When is the right time to hire? Ideally, in your slow season, because you have time to train. Also a good time to start looking to hire if you are more than 80% booked four weeks in advance. This is a soft target, but it's a sign you have way more work than you can handle each week. And if you grow anymore, you will start losing work to people who don't want to wait that long. Another sign you're ready to hire is that you have all or part of their salary saved you should probably have a minimum of one month's salary in the bank to help with cash flow in your business. But your ability to be profitable and save in your business ahead of hiring an employee is actually a sign that you are able and ready to hire. So in your guide, we have a checklist with a lot more info uh, to help you walk through whether or not you are ready to hire. You know when it isn't the time to hire? Don't plan to hire after a long week. <laughs> this is about as bad as going grocery shopping when you're hungry. It feels good, but it rarely has the best outcome, right? This is true at the end of your busy season as well. This is not the time to be making big changes in the long-term direction of your company. Instead, take some time, go on vacation, make a plan, and slowly build towards a company that is designed to succeed by adding team members along the way and confidently build your team with less stress and successfully transition from being a freelancer to a business owner who knows exactly how this piece or this person fits into the story of the company you're building. And this is where you wanna go with your business. Don't be afraid to dream bigger and lay out some ambitious goals. Gazelle has the products and the community you need to make this a success. And many of the historical limitations just are not there anymore. So, all right. If you think you're ready to hire and you're asking yourself, what's my next step? Drop me a line. You can email me at george at gazelleapp.io. I'm here as a soundboard to help you proceed with confidence. So our team is supporting piano technicians in over 30 countries to help them grow their piano service business. And we've seen just about every variation of success and failure you can imagine. Now, this isn't always easy, but you know what's even harder? Wasting time spinning your wheels and never finding the answers to your questions, constantly wondering, why can't I get any traction? So if you want to grow, stagnating is the worst thing you can do. Just staying where you are, wasting time spinning in circles will never get you anywhere because you're actually not going anywhere. But if you follow these steps, you can get moving on building the right team so you can go from someone who has who is scared to waste time and money hiring the wrong person in your business to someone who knows exactly when and how to successfully hire your first technician. Whether that means you remain a freelancer who chooses to subcontract or you decide to put in place the things you need to successfully manage an employee as a business. Both approaches have their merits. And now 
you're ready to consider which one's best for you. All right, we're going to transition to Q&A. So while we do that, and our team sorts through the questions, um, we're going to, here's a quick poll and a list of upcoming webinars that are coming soon. See, here at Gazelle, we focus on technicians that are frustrated by inefficient scheduling of appointments, struggling to keep up with sending out estimates and invoices on time, and lacking enough monthly revenue to consistently be profitable. So if any of those resonate for you, then let us know through the poll and we can see how we can serve you. Thanks, George and Tim. You guys did a great job. Um, we have had some questions rolling in already. And uh, let's get right to it. So the first question um, is related to job descriptions. So it is, do you have any templates for job descriptions? In my particular case, I'm looking for a description for a field technician, general tunings and repairs and selling larger uh, work all the way up to rebuilding. Yeah. Uh no, it was a little bit intentional that we didn't give a carbon copy template here because in our experience, I mean, like George said, we support piano techs in over 30 countries. I've actually had the chance to talk to people about the job description. The job descriptions vary widely. And so it is really up to you to just grab a cup of coffee. It probably will take you less than 30 minutes of work. You just need to clear your space, clear your head, but it's not just asking the question, what do I want this person to do? Isn't the right way to go about it. What you want to do is really ask a different question of what does a successful field technician in my company look like? They are the kind of person that does this, this, and this. There's your success metrics. Now, off of those success metrics, you probably want to ask the question, well, how are they going to achieve that? and then fill out the how becomes the job description. And so I would just grab a cup of coffee or your preferred drink and sit down and have at it. And like we said, this is if this is your first hire, it's probably not gonna be that like polished, but you wanna make sure you put it in there like, hey, this is the first time I've hired someone and three months from now, we're gonna reevaluate to make sure both of us are really happy with this. But if you start with what does success look like and then how do they achieve that success? You're gonna find the job description writes itself for your company, uh, but you're the one who's qualified to actually speak to that. And George, I'm curious uh, what kind of thoughts you have on that because you've written a lot of job descriptions. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, honestly, that, that first thing you said, or the last thing you said there, the what does success look like? I would agree with Tim. Um, so I'd also say not just one cup of coffee, but sit down and do this three times. So the first time you do it, you sit down and ask yourself, what does success look like? What is it that I expect them to do? What are the tasks, right? So as you go through your day, ask yourself, what is it I expect them to do? The actual tasks. Second question I would ask is, what are the processes that I think that are really important? Not just the tasks I'm expecting, but the how they do that task, right? The idea, one of the things we listed was the idea of um, always taking your shoes off at the door. It's one thing to say, I arrive and walk into the house. It's another thing to say, take your shoes off at the door. And then thirdly, you need to stop, put that, put, put that list away for a week, get a third cup of coffee, pull that list back out, and now ask yourself, where am I being too picky? Where have I tried to create a carbon copy of myself? Where can I allow my new staff's personality to show? What matters most? So, personality is not that they drop their shoes at the door. That may be a, this is what our company does. This is what we value. We, which is the other piece I would add is know your company's values. One of our values is we always respect the customer. This is the way that, this is what that looks like. We take our shoes off. We greet them. Um, there might be, when, when they walk through the room, we always say hello, no matter what we're doing. Uh, I'm coming up with different ways. So yeah, ask, <laughs> Ask so yourself one, what the values are. Go ahead. Yeah, one, one thing that came to mind here is one of the things I did, and this actually came from one of the people that mentored me, uh, was I used to ask, you know, people always ask, hey, can I get you anything? Can I get you a glass of water? I used to always answer that based off of whether or not I was thirsty. And one of my mentors told me, no, I always say yes, because it changes the dynamic of the relationship in their home. They've given you a gift. You are now a friend, not a service provider, not just somebody that's going to take from them. 
And so as a value in our company, we wanted that experience from the customer to the technician to be, uh, you know, that there is that relationship there of we are friends. And so when I sat down and really started thinking this through, I realized it was wrong for me to say, always ask for a glass of water if the person could also point out that there was another way they succeeded in changing the dynamic of the relationship. And so, you know, I didn't put, ask for the glass of water in the success metric, but I put, you know, we want this, right? So anyway, that's, that's how I would think about it. Um, and, and that's how I separated it out in my head as I was training people. Uh, and if I ever put my foot down and said, no, I need you to do this in this way, it was because there was a really big value attached to it. Yeah, yeah. know your values. So I, I think that that's it in a nutshell. Know your values, know your tasks, make your list, let it sit aside for a moment, come back to it and ask yourself, where am I making a carbon copy of myself? Where am I just saying these are the values of my company? Great. All right, so the next question is, if I want to bring someone on who doesn't have any training, how should I go about that? That's a great question. Um, I'm assuming you don't already have a training program in place or some kind of mentorship program in place. Let's just start there. Don't. That's where we're going to start. Um, this is not somebody that you need to bring into your business right now, but they're really good, but they have a lot of potential. Hey, they're a wrong fit for your company right now. Now, that doesn't have to always be true. So let's go about fixing it, right? Maybe you become a guide to them. You say, listen, hey, I would really love to hire you. Uh, you don't have training. I actually don't have the ability or the capacity to train you right now. And I know that if we start down this road, this is not going to work out. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to be your biggest cheerleader in getting you training. What resources do you have? Tell me what you need. I'm going to help you find training. And as you get trained, there's going to be a position here that I will consider you for. Um, so maybe, maybe they go do a correspondence course if they're going to stay local and you're just like one of those mentors in their life who is helping them along. Maybe that you help them go get a scholarship at one of the schools and a year from now they're an employee. I don't know what it is. I just know that today if you don't have the capacity to train them, then they're not a good fit. And nothing is going to change the end outcome if you take them on today and you're not ready to train them. Okay, great. Um, so the next question um, is, how often should I run payroll for employees versus subcontractors? This is, this is a good question. Um, I think, well, I'll say the first answer I'll say to that is you run it as often as you agreed to. So if you agreed in your, with your subcontract that you would be paying them monthly or paying them biweekly, then you need to live to that. Now, which agreement you come to, I'm gonna to actually toss to Tim, but. <laughs> yeah, uh, talk to your accountant. Uh, but I'll tell you what I did. I had this pervasive thing I did in my company. I made it easy for people to do business with me. And I also focused on making it easy for me to run my business and made it easy for people to be in my business. So every decision I made, I passed through that filter. And, you know, I, I had this situation. I had employees, I had subcontractors, and I made it easy on my accountant by paying everybody on the exact same schedule. Otherwise, they were constantly, I was going to drive my accountant crazy. Um, and so anyway, and, and I paid them twice a month because there's fewer pay cycles. There's less accounting work done when you pay on the 1st and 15th, opposed to every two weeks. Um, and for me, once a month was just too long to pay anybody because I always paid on one payroll lag uh, because my accountant needed time to actually get the books in place to know how much to pay everybody because we had a commission structure. And so... Um, the, you know, if I did it monthly, then they, it would just been too long of a lag. So we paid on the first and 15th, one pay cycle delayed. So our accountant had time to run the numbers. Um, so make it easy for you to run your business and for the people like your accountant to work in your business and whichever uh, pay cycle makes that true, run with that. Okay, great. 
Uh, all right, so we have one final question that has come in. Um, and this question is, uh, I have already hired someone and I am trying to help them sell more regulation and repair jobs, but they don't know enough to properly quote things. How would you recommend handling this situation? Uh, I have an answer for this one, Tim, unless do you have something? No, run, run with oh, it. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, honestly, the first thing I would say is if you're using Gazelle, then this is a great time to get to know the estimate feature in Gazelle. Um, with the way that that's set up, you're able to easily set up a estimate. You're able to then walk the customer through what their options are. And because everything is automated and already plugged in, it'll have prices already set. Um, it'll make it much easier for somebody to be able to sell. And honestly, they're able to do a soft sell by just leaving that estimate with the customer. And it makes it easier for your tech to be able to upsell without having to be the hard sell uh, by properly quoting it because it's actually being done automatically. And actually, there is a video that we've done on Gazelle's estimates feature that you can watch that on our growwithgazelle.com. Yeah, uh, it's, it was the Create Estimates at Sell webinar that we did um, when we rolled out that feature. So yeah. I would start by having them watch that. Um, I, I have two thoughts running through here. Uh, number one, you need to do this away from life, away from service calls, not with the clients in the house, not at your shop, just over coffee somewhere. And just sit down and just say, hey, uh, I'm really interested in helping you succeed as a technician. Uh, what are the top three things on your list that you feel are deficits that I can be mentoring you in? or helping you achieve. And probably this is gonna be on that list. And if not, you need to consider whether this is the thing that you need to be focusing on right now. Uh, but let's just assume that, hey, I'm really uncomfortable like talking to people and um, I just find that I'm never successful at selling and I'm not sure how to do that. So I avoid it because it's awkward. It's like, okay, great, can we dive into that? Um, and I would just lay out, I mean, just, pause for a minute because it's probably really easy for you to, you, you already know how to sell, you can evaluate it. This feels like for them, they are standing on the edge of a raging river. They don't even know how to properly evaluate the piano. There's all this like regulation and there's so many things like they don't understand it. Your job is to say, listen, we're going to get through this together. Do you see that rock right there? It's not a big step. Come on, we're going to step onto that rock. Okay, great. Now there's this other rock over here. Don't step on that because you'll slip in. We're going to go over here and then we're going to go here. And then next thing you know, we're going to be on the other side and I'm going to help you get through this. So now that first thing that we need to do is I need you to know that I have your back. And if you ever get a piano that you're not sure how to estimate, snap a picture and text it to me and I'll be available to talk you through that. But I want you to try to estimate everything. And this is where Gazelle's really nice. What I would do with my apprentices when they were really young, I'd say, put an estimate together. Go ahead and try, do your best. Send me some pictures of the piano and take pictures of the piano on the estimate and then Slack me. We used a, a chat app called Slack and I will go look at your estimate and then give you feedback on it. So the first few times this happened, they would create an estimate in the home with, you know, the client is uh, there, they're working on the piano and they would typically like do the estimate at the end of the appointment. They take time to do it. They take pictures, they send it to me. And I would just say, okay, look, it looks like you missed this, 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 and this. Have you checked that out on this piano? And then they would go and update the estimate and check a few things out. And I would provide feedback. And I kind of knew if they hit this piano on the head, because if they gave me a spinet that had $5 of work and it had been serviced in 20 years, I would just know like, okay, that's not really accurate. If they gave me an 80 year old piano that needed a full rebuild and there was only $2,000 worth of work in there, I'd look at that and be like, ah, uh, there's probably more there. You're missing the fact that the soundboard's cracked. You needed to swap out the soundboard. Um, you know, whatever it is, I was able to provide that mentorship to them and really held their hand the whole way. And you know, the other thing is I would sit them down and just say, Listen, you are going to earn more money because when you do estimates, they're really easy to sell. Just tell the customer it's built for this, it's currently performing here. 
Uh, I put everything in musical terms. You know, if you can't play soft, if you can play, anyway, just make it really easy for them, walk with them. And after they do, with my people, once they did like five to 15 estimates, they kind of got their sea legs. And then they just started doing them a lot more. Um, and they loved them because it meant every time they sold a job, they made more money. And then they were really incentivized to actually do that. So um, anyway, uh, that's how I handled it. And you can run with that and take it for what it's worth. <laughs> Thank you, guys. All right, that gets us to the end of the questions. This has been a really great uh, evening, great webinar. You guys put together a lot of really good material here to kind of chew on and think through. So thank you for your time and thank everyone for, thank you all for attending. Um, hope that uh, we'll see you again soon. Um, yeah, have a good night. Bye-bye.